You had one big battle already at Goose Green. You learned any lessons from that? Learned a lot of lessons. Mm. What sort of things? Well, fighting through. Just keep on going. There's no stop, no turning back. It's just straight through. Well, we've got to do, haven't we? You know, we can't just jack halfway. We've got to carry on. We've got to take Stanley. No stopping us now, I don't reckon. What about the rightness of it all? Um, well, it started off as British soil. Uh, Argy's barged in. And we're here to kick him out. The 11th of June. Two para, rested after their victory at Darwin Goose Green, prepared to leave Fitzroy for their assembly area behind Mount Kent. General Moore's forces are now in position, holding the vital ground west of Stanley, ready for the decisive battle. In the north, on Mount Estancia, three para. On Mount Kent, four five commando. On the eastern ridge of Mount Challenger, four two commando. To the south, five brigade are also in position, preparing for their part in the battle to come. Forty commando remain at San Carlos, protecting the force maintenance area and one company of the 1st 7th Gurkha Rifles are left in defence of Darwin and Goose Green. So now we're poised on the dominating ground, looking down the throats, really, of the main enemy positions all round Stanley. And we've got to the problem of overrunning those positions and bringing about, really, the enemy's surrender, preferably without having to go on and fight in and around the town. So, really, we could have come anywhere from about the northwest through to sneaking along and up from the south. It had seemed to me all along that the enemy's attention was focused very much to the south. And it, I was always anxious to keep his attention focused that way because we were going to have, therefore, if we did do that, our easiest way in if we came from the northwest and west. The second factor was that this is very big open ground and the enemy was going to see everything for a long way before we got to him. And this, of course, led one always to think in terms of fighting our battles at night. And I think it's an important point to make uh, in the context of this uh, campaign, that uh, we all recognise that night attacks, even at company level and with experienced troops, are very difficult operations. We also had the uh, option of going for a broad front or a narrow front attack, and in the end, we went for a fairly broad front attack, and it started in phase one with three commander brigade who'd been established forward and got good reconnaissance of the ground in front of them, carrying out a three battalion night attack onto Mount Longdon, Two Sisters and Mount Harriet. And we were going to follow this originally only 24 hours later, but in the event, because they needed the time and quite rightly needed the time for ground reconnaissance and things, 48 hours later with both brigades attacking simultaneously in the north, three commander brigade with one battalion taking Wireless Ridge, and five brigade in succession taking Mount Tumbledown, Mount William, and then moving on to Sapper Hill. And this really was right on top then of Port Stanley itself. Now it was in my mind that this really ought to bring the enemy to surrender. He had no more ground of any value to him. My guns were going to be dominating and able to fire on all the ground right the way back to the airfield. Uh, and I felt that this must bring about his surrender. But in the event that it didn't, then we were going to have to fight on along the high ground to the south of Stanley itself. And uh, I, in fact, left to see how the first two phases went, the decision on which brigade was going to carry out that phase. Logistics were never more crucial to General Moore's planning than now. 
Forward maintenance areas had been established at Deal Inlet and Fitzroy. From where supplies landed from LSLs were the lifeline of the brigades, now poised for the final offensive. Helicopters worked ceaselessly, ferrying artillery, rations, and above all, ammunition. Facing our forces in well-prepared positions on all the main features were two infantry regiments and a marine infantry force of at least battalion strength. Although a high proportion of these men were conscripts, among them was a hard core of well-trained, highly motivated and well-equipped professional soldiers. And of course, they had had time to prepare their defences, time to sight weapons, time to dig positions, and time to lay mines and wire. Neither General Moore nor his brigade commanders were in any doubt that their units would have to fight hard for their objectives. Phase one of General Moore's plan was to be a silent attack mounted by three commando brigade on the night of 11th, 12th June. In the north, three paras objective was Mount Longdon. In the center, four five commando would take two sisters. In the south, four two commando Mount Harriet and Goat Ridge. Two para, now part of three commando brigade once more, were to be the reserve, positioned behind three para and four five commando, while the Welsh guards, with two companies of 40 commando replacing the men lost and injured on Sir Galahad, secured the start line for four two commando. In phase two, involving both brigades, three commando brigade was to secure Wireless Ridge, a task allocated to two para. Under command of five brigade, the Scots guards would capture Mount Tumbledown, after which the first seventh Gurkha rifles would pass through their positions and seize Mount William. The Welsh guards would be in reserve for this operation, after which they were to capture Sapper Hill. Of all the units involved in phase one, four two commando had been in position longest, Having been helicoptered forward on the 1st of June, they had now been in their exposed positions on Mount Challenger for 10 freezing days. From the start, Mount Harriet had been their obvious objective, and Lieutenant Colonel Nick Vox had been able to prepare his plans thoroughly. The crucial factor in any attack, especially at night, is the route uh, chosen. And that certainly was a decisive factor in the case of Mount Harriet. So we were extremely fortunate that we had 10 days uh, in which to develop this, although we didn't know that at the time. Initially, I favoured left flanking because there was a more covered approach and I was secure with 4-5 commando. Later on, I had to abandon that. First, there wasn't room for two units, and secondly, the enemy uh, had heavily fortified in that direction. Little point in going up the centre, apart from the natural obstacle of the, the valley between Mount Wall and Harriet, we discovered to our cost that there were minefields there. So towards the end, it became clear that we had to do something in this very open and exposed flat ground on the right flank. To begin with, we had to find a route through the minefields, and this required extremely resolute and, in some cases, very brave patrolling by people like Sergeant Collins to actually find a way. I was a troop sergeant in K Company, and once our objective was established as Mount Harriet, my CO detailed me for the job of wrecking the positions on Mount Harriet. The brief outline was that I would move with one of the troops of Juliet Company off the front slopes of Challenger, Mount Challenger, down onto the road and along towards the enemy and basically find out what they'd got there. We would move off in company with a troop. I would have a four-man team. We would leave two sections of the troop about three k's out from the objective and go on with a further section. I'd drop that section about a k away from the objective and I'd go in with my four guys and see what we could find. We moved out that night at about 10 o'clock across the top of Mount Challenger, which was a fairly high feature. 
dropping down into the saddle and turning south onto the road. As we crossed over the road, we made a small RV and went into all-round defence where we dropped our two cover sections off and I left those with the troop sergeant. I moved off myself with my other cover section and closed in along the side of Wall Mountain. I had some information that there would be mines in the area and when I came across a single strand of wire at about ankle high, I stopped the patrol and moved up and down it to check the wire myself. After imagining that perhaps that was the front of a minefield that ran across the front of Wall Mountain, I withdrew and moved down the wire towards the road, the rest of the patrol following me. One of my patrol spotted the enemy moving onto the road behind us, that is, nearer the mines, and coming up the road towards us. He gave me the buzz, and we turned off the road and tried to disappear into the night. We took cover first in a stream, but that was too close. We upped again and moved about 100 metres from the road and took cover. We formed into a skirmish line, by which time the Argentinians had come out and they were roughly opposite us, st still on the road. They formed into their skirmish line and moved towards us. Then a very strange thing happened. They went to ground, only about 50, 70 metres away from us, and started calling to us in Spanish. I can only assume that they thought we were perhaps stragglers trying to get back into their lines. We'd lay there and just let them get on with it. If it was going to be a question of uh, staring it out in those conditions, I knew we were going to win. After about an hour or so, they gave up the ghost and moved back, on, moved back onto the road. There we were able to watch them move along the road and then back up onto their positions on Mount Harriet. And this pinpointed the exact area I needed to scan with my night sight. The hour came up on the watch and their sentries changed exactly on the hour and that indicated exactly where two or three of their sentry positions were. After staying there for a further hour, I was able to pick out some of their defensive locations. Despite its obvious disadvantages, I decided by now that we must go right flanking, especially as we'd managed to patrol successfully round to the enemy's rear, and it seemed possible that we could achieve surprise by coming at them from that direction. The plan, therefore, was to move forward the two rifle companies, K and L, in phase to a start line, uh, more or less behind the enemy, and for the remaining company to provide support and be in reserve. A rough missed the fucking runway. Some nice bombs all around it, but there are 13 aircraft, some of which are definitely Pukera, parked on the aprons around Stanley Airfield. There is also another report in that they have managed to reinforce themselves with helicopters from the mainland. They've now got the capability to lift two companies for reinforcements. We know how they're going to reinforce themselves because on the slopes of Mount Kent, if you jump at the back, they left a tented area which contained their off orders for the defence of this area. Right. And they are prepared to lose 50% of their supporting troops. The timings, the exact timings are that this will start rolling at about one and this will start rolling at about three. And so on, on board timings. Eventually, Peter Babington's company reached the start line an hour late, but nevertheless in good order, and the attack uh, commenced shortly after that, once I was sure that the second company was in the FUP. When we got to the start line, which was the main track uh, that runs between Darwin and uh, Stanley, I called my troop commanders forward and got them down in the ditch beside the road, and we viewed the objective. The objective was very, very clear with Puss's binoculars, and we could quite clearly see the company boundaries and the inter-troop boundaries, and they could all see quite clearly their objectives. Once I was quite sure they were happy, I then sent them back to their troops to quickly brief their men, and we shook out in our assault formation, which was one troop to my left forward, two troopers right forward, three troopers rear. I then called up the colonel and said we were ready to go. And this was now about one o'clock in the morning. And he said, right, off you go. We moved off from the start line on our advance, which was about 800 metres. The whole situation over this next sort of 10, 15 minutes seemed very unreal because the enemy didn't fire at us. We were doing something that we'd been trained to do for many times, the, the formal company attack. And somehow doing it and nobody firing us seemed very unreal. We got to a position about 150 metres short of the objective when my uh, forward observation officer, uh, 
um, Captain Chris Rombo, told me that he'd had to now cancel the targets that he originally planned for us on the advance, and that our nearest target was now right on the objective itself and was within our safety distances. I said, well, he was to engage it anyway if we were to come under fire. And it's very soon after this that one troop on the left-hand side reported seeing the enemy. And at this stage, I thought that, well, surprise had been achieved. We were now up onto the objective area and that we must engage the, while we still had the surprise on our side. One troop then engaged and two troop on the right-hand side moved very quickly up onto the enemy position that they were to take. We all started to pepper pot forward and make our way to the hill. Um, there were blokes running and screaming and going everywhere. Um, most of that was just fire control orders and we were trying to get something back at them because they were trying to hit us something awful. And then we all got into the cover of rocks because we all had different tasks to do. So we were all busy doing our own thing, really. We got within about 50 to 60 metres of where we were supposed to be. And I was listening to the radio and I heard Corporal Ward say that he was uh, under sniper fire and he couldn't move. And Corporal Ward, who was... Uh, my opposite number in another troop was on the other side of the feature at this time. So it meant that somebody had to go somewhere to get this sniper. And as we were in the ideal position at the time, that meant that one of us had to go. And as I had the radio and knew what was going on, that had to be me. So I just went over the top, climbed up uh, a fairly steepish hill, um, went to my left, to link up with L Company, who had then got up level with us, to tell them that I was going to go on up and for them not to shoot me. Linked up with them, crawled another 50 metres, then zigzagged to my right, to my left, went round another big rock, got to the top of that and peered round the corner because the enemy was somewhere within that vicinity. And when I looked round the corner, I discovered that there wasn't just one sniper there was perhaps half a troop, and they were just taking turns at shooting, so it looked like a sniper. So something had to be done about them, and as I was on my own, it had to be me to do it. So I just took out two grenades, changed my magazine, so I had a full load, threw in two grenades, one at the gun that was on the end, and the other one in amongst all the bodies. Just waited for them to go off, step around the corner, loosed off three to five rounds at anything that moved, uh, withdrew, back round to the safe cover of my rock, uh, talked to Corporal Ward again and said, I've, uh, I've hit him, and he said, stand by, 266s are coming down because it's clearing. So he put 266s in and then he said, will you go back round to where you were to make sure that they don't escape out the back? And as I walked back around the corner, one of these guys that I'd already shot had been, I'd only hit him in the shoulder and I didn't have time to check he was dead. And as I walked around, he just squeezed a burst off, uh, got me in both legs. He then proceeded to, to die rather rapidly because I was a bit upset. Um, I withdrew back around to the corner, told Corporal Ward I was hit and could he get to me. Uh, he, he was a bit busy taking prisoners at the time. So I got onto the radio, told my boss I'd been hit, asked him to send my own section back up to me so that they could be put back on the axis, and then I started to patch myself up a bit. The battle from the moment it started till we had completed and taken our objectives up to the saddle, I suppose lasted about four hours. In that time, the company took about 72 prisoners, including the regimental colonel of number four regiment, and we had lost one corporal killed, one corporal injured, and another four marines injured from shell fire. Over the, the next few hours, as daylight came onto the, uh, the hillside, they found about another 200 prisoners, um, or 200 Argentinians, in various states of hiding around the hillside. So the whole position offered up at the end about 300 prisoners. Four two commanders attack on Mount Harriet was a brilliant success. The enemy, well dug in and prepared to fight, were taken completely by surprise as the Marines came in through the back door. Meticulous preparations had indeed paid off. Meanwhile, further north, 
four or five commanders' attack on two sisters had met early and fierce resistance. However, supported by accurate 66mm fire, the Marines fought through strong enemy positions and by dawn, the Twin Peaks had been captured. And last night, we came up as a company to take this position here. They removed themselves from where we initially had contact. Was that machine gun? That was a machine gun, yes. They'd, they weren't there. The first troop took that. And as we came up, about uh, 200 meters, we came under fire from up here and also further down as well. And then we simply came up as a company, uh, two troop came up here and took the SF positions, the machine gun positions, which were up here. Uh, we reckon there was about a, a company, but as we came up to them, they, they ran out, they bugged out. What um, kind of uh, what kind of weapons did they have? Is it just machine guns? GPMGs, the same machine guns that we use. Yeah. And you, FNs. You were under fire on the way uh, up, were you? Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. What kind of fight did they put up? Uh, initially, heavy fire. And then it, it appeared that as we put down our fire, and we were using the, the 66 anti-tank weapon, uh, they began to move, move back from there. It appeared that they, leaved, they left sort of die-hard chaps up here, um, and as we got closer to them, they also ran away. So in fact, we found no one up here at all. By the time we got here, they'd all gone. Of the three Phase One objectives, Mount Harriet, Two Sisters, and Mount Longdon, the northernmost, Mount Longdon, was considerably further forward of the other two. It was the objective of three para and it proved to be the costliest land battle of the campaign. We had um, about a four-hour approach march to the mountain, and not only was I aware that the overall brigade plan uh, was intended to be a silent approach, but I myself would have gone for that approach in any case. The Argentine artillery was active. Uh, our forming up places, assembly areas, and start lines were going to be fairly obvious to any intelligent enemy commander. And therefore, we did not want to preempt the surprise we hoped to achieve on the mountain and possibly be subjected to quite heavy um, artillery fire in these various areas that we were going to use on our route to the start line. Surprise, however, was the predominant factor uh, which led me to favor a, a silent attack. On the tumble-down side of Mount Longdon, there was a very obvious valley approach um, and across the Murrell Bridge. All intelligence indicated that this was heavily mined. It was a very obvious approach, very dominated by Tumbledown, and really I could not consider it. Indeed, we wanted to try to fight our battle on the northern side of the mountain as far as possible in order to protect ourselves from Tumbledown. As the companies moved across the start line and across the very open terrain moving upwards towards the ridge line of Longdon and the rocky summit of the mountain itself. It was at some stage during this fairly long advance over open and very dominated ground that surprise was finally lost. A company, the company, the left assault company, who moved onto the ridge to the north of Mount Longdon itself, had relatively little difficulty in um, gaining that ridge, which turned out to be totally undefended, uh, but as soon as they reached it, they came under extremely accurate fire from uh, a number of heavy machine guns on the summit of the mountain itself. Meanwhile, uh, B Company, the company that was assaulting the western end of the summit, um, gained the first rocks, and whilst the machine gun fire continued relatively inaccurately over their heads and down into the valleys to the west, uh, they began to come under much more accurate and lethal um, small arms fire from uh, a number of marksmen, clearly with very uh, good equipment. We'd moved up along the side of Mount Longdon with a lot of effective enemy fire onto us, with a lot of grenades being thrown at us. We'd got to a position of two large rocks. Uh, I'd moved forward along the side of these rocks to a, a low bank where Mr. Cox, Mr. Bickerdyke, and Sergeant Mackay joined me. At this moment, we were looking towards the next enemy position where Mr. Bickerdyke was shot. He then, being tended by Mr. Cox, shouted over to Sergeant Mackay, is now your platoon, Sergeant Mackay. We moved forward at the double with uh, covering fire from part of four platoon and five platoon section guns. As we were moving across, the private across to my left was shot, and I later found out to be killed. 
We're moving up to the main rock feature now, and I was actually shot in the hip. Sergeant Mackay carried on around the side of this position, taking out a number of trenches, and was later found, I was told, in the trench with the enemy dead all around him. Once I'd been shot in the hip, it just felt like somebody was knocking you out and you were seeing stars. And when I actually did open my eyes, all I was looking up into was the, the night sky with a lot of stars looking down at me. Uh, there was a lot of noise still going on, which I assumed to be Sergeant Mackay still taking out the enemy, and people shouting my name. There then seemed to be a lull in the battle. Um, I heard movement, and I assumed that the enemy to be moved. And as I looked across, as I moved my head, I could see the actual tent and the position where I'd been shot from. I then decided I was going to move, and as I rolled over, uh, I heard them in some type of language to say, I assumed it to be, he's still there, and they then shot me again in the neck and the hand. The one on the hand was a, a trace around, because I, I actually watched it burn. I then decided I wasn't going to move again. For his outstanding and selfless act of courage, Sergeant Ian Mackay was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. We were learning how to use our artillery fire much more intimately than originally. Um, and this was an essential element in our success. Uh, I was quite unable to detect most of the time whether the incoming fire was our own guns supporting us or the enemy um, firing upon us, because as the Argentines lost ground, so uh, the their own observed artillery fire crept eastwards along the mountain behind us and made life um, extremely unpleasant. By the end of that night, uh, and it took all night to clear the mountain. By the end of that night, uh, we were crawling forward from one bunker to another, from one position to another. And, of course, many of the enemy had died by this time at very close range, some um, at the point of the bayonet. It was, uh, in summary, a long, hard, cold fight. But by first light, the mountain was quite clearly ours. During the night, we had 17 soldiers killed, uh, and slightly upwards of 40 injured. Some, of course, quite minor injuries, but um, amongst them, some much more serious ones. And the um, problem of evacuating the casualties, and indeed um, identifying where those casualties were, even with their uh, red ESCO lights uh, plugged in, uh, that problem was a very considerable one. And in some cases, it was not until first light that we were finally able to find and evacuate some of our own casualties back down to the regimental aid post. Even with all the resistance on Mount Longdon itself silenced, three para was to go on taking casualties for the next 36 hours from enemy shell fire, controlled by OPs on Mount Tumbledown, which dominates Mount Longdon. From positions such as this, the Argentine gunners brought down quick and accurate fire on anyone who moved. The mental effects this had on the soldiers were perhaps even more worrying than the physical effects. They felt that they couldn't um, react or respond in any way, and this caused great frustration, great anger, and in some cases, um, depression. I indeed had one case, clear case, um, of uh, battle shock during this period. The final casualty figures suffered by three para in the action for Mount Longdon and the subsequent bombardment totaled 23 killed and 47 wounded. By mid-morning of the 12th of June, all three Phase One objectives had been taken. Mount Harriet, Two Sisters and Mount Longdon. In Phase Two of the battle, scheduled for the night the 12th, 13th June, two para, who had moved up in reserve behind 4-5 Commando and three para, were to attack Wireless Ridge from the north. While to the south, the Scots Guards were to be airlifted from Bluff Cove to an assembly area west of Mount Harriet for their attack on Mount Tumbledown. Similarly, the Gurkhas were to be helicoptered into position for their assault on Mount William. Unlike three commando brigade, well established on the high ground before the start of phase one, in phase two, five brigade were to take on their objectives almost unseen. Brigadier Tony Wilson, the commander of five brigade, therefore requested a delay of 24 hours to enable his commanding officers to reconnoitre and plan their battles more fully. So it was on the morning of the 13th that the Scots Guards and Gurkhas were airlifted to their assembly areas. 
The delay of 24 hours was invaluable to the Scots guards in particular, tasked with taking the formidable feature of Mount Tumbledown, steep, rock-strewn and honeycombed with natural bunkers, occupied by men of the 5th Marine Infantry, some of the most determined and well-equipped Argentine troops on the Falklands. Lieutenant Colonel Michael Scott was initially ordered to attack from the southwest, which looked the easiest route, but it was also the most obvious one, exposed to long-range direct fire from the many well-sighted and prepared enemy positions on Tumbledown. In the shelter of Mount Harriet, now firmly in 4-2 commander's hands, was a possible assembly area from which the Scots guards would be well placed to attack the western end of Tumbledown. This approach from the west, between Mount Harriet and Goat Ridge, offered more cover and was much less obvious. It would have the further advantage of taking the Argentine positions from the side rather than head on. Brigadier Wilson approved this change of plan. Half an hour before the first company crossed the start line, we put in a diversionary attack on the southern flank, which was the obvious route that the Argentinians thought we would come. Then quite simply after that, there were three phases. The leading company, G Company, would take the western end of Tumbledown, and then phase two would be left flank's attack on the centre and main part of the objective, and finally finishing with right flank's attack, phase three, on the eastern end of Tumbledown Mountain. This is the route taken by the diversionary force, descending the slopes of Mount Harriet in a southeasterly direction, Mount William in the background crossing the track to Stanley and engaging a strongly held series of enemy positions here in this area of Gorse. The value of the diversionary attack exceeded all the amount of soldiers that I had to put into it. There were 30 men led by Major Richard Bethel, made up mostly from the recce platoon and the training office, but with some others as well, together with Lieutenant Mark Corris, reconnaissance troop of scimitars and scorpions. They attacked on the, southerly, on the southerly route and met some very stiff Argentinian opposition. They lost two men killed in the first volley, really, and then got very involved with some hand-to-hand -hand fighting and had to withdraw once they were mortared. And in doing so, they lost two, two men lost uh, feet on mines and had to be carried out by the others, some of whom were already wounded, to get back to the troop and get on them and evacuate. As the diversionary action was underway, the main attack began. G Company leading the advance eastwards, ahead, in the darkness, lay Tumbledown. G Company took their objective, the first area of high ground, unopposed, having achieved complete surprise. The battle began in earnest as left flank moved through G Company into the open ground, dominated by the high crags at the western extremity of the mountain. The left forward platoon began climbing the rocky gully to take those crags. My company moved through G Company with two platoons forward. Left was 13 platoon, uh, commanded by James Stewart, and right 15 platoon, commanded by Alistair Mitchell, with my own company headquarters between those platoons. The platoons are in extended line with about 200 metres behind my reserve platoon with the other part of my company headquarters. And as we moved forward down to the very low ground at the foot of Tumbledown, really the atmosphere in the company was electric because to that point the enemy had not opened fire at all and we didn't know at what stage he was going to open fire and with what. People were walking forward not knowing whether it was going to be a burst of machine gun fire, whether it was going to be a sniper, artillery fire, perhaps a mortar bomb landing down beside them, or whether they're going to tread on a mine. And we went forward for about 300 metres like this, just not knowing. And the question was soon answered, because when the Argentinians did open fire, they opened fire with everything they had, and from about 300 metres range, it was really quite cleverly done. And as we went to ground, we were taking casualties already. 13 platoon up in the rocks, from the snipers with uh, very good night sights who were starting to pick them off and down with the platoon that I was with by the heavy machine gun fire to our front. My task was to take the left-hand side of Tumbledown as I was the left forward platoon of, of the left flank company. 
Uh, the problem that we faced was a series of isolated Argentinian snipers who were unable to get away. We went about 100 meters up the gully before they started to open fire on us. And almost straight away, my platoon sergeant, uh, Sergeant Simeon, and a guardsman, Tambini, were killed. Several other guardsmen were hit, one or two who were, who were shot in the chest, but who were saved by bits of equipment on them. Uh, the second in command of the left forward section, who was hit to the cheek. Uh, and almost immediately, the whole system became a series of isolated sections fighting their own battles. Now, because I was unable to win the fire fight with direct fire weapons, I therefore wanted to use all the indirect fire support, which I've been told we had, to try and neutralize the enemy. Um, and we've been told there were three batteries of guns, two ships, two mortar platoons. But instead of the deafening crash of all these shells landing on the enemy to our front, all that actually landed on the ground was one rather apologetic mortar round. The time that it took to uh, register the artillery on target was considerable. It was almost two hours before we actually achieved that aim. And during that time, men were lying around getting very cold. The night had cleared slightly, but there were snow flurries coming across. The temperature was well below zero. And people were suffering really quite badly from exposure. One man close to me was unconscious and had to be dragged away. And my own signaller and I were both lying side by side shivering. But uh, our inhibitions didn't really allow us to uh, have bodily contact until really it was so cold that uh, we got together and started warming each other. And he suddenly said to me in, in his irrepressible Cockney accent, hey, sir, what are they going to think if we're both killed and they find our bodies like this? I remember standing up trying to get a better look and being shot at by a 66 anti tank rocket from one of my own section commanders. There was a lot of chaos. Guardsmen were trying to fire back, but couldn't find out where the Argentinian snipers were. Eventually, after a pause in the battle, we were able to sort ourselves out. We sent the wounded back down the mountain, and the two section commanders working together were able to work themselves round behind the Argentinians and cut the snipers off from their friends and eventually kill them using grenades and 66 mm anti 66 millimeter anti-tank rockets. Once we got control again, Myself and the right-hand section commander, Sergeant McGuinness, um, made a plan along with the platoon commander. I was to put cover and fire down first, and Sergeant McGuinness would move forward and um, take out the enemy that was in the rocks to the front. After he had gone firm, I was to move forward very slowly as I was in the open ground, and we went on like this up the top of the hill using 66, 84, and White Foss and L2 grenades to take the enemy out. The Argentinian snipers were well prepared. They had communication cord between each other. This, this we were able to follow until we eventually found their nests and removed them with grenades or with the bayonet. There weren't very many of them. We found about six or seven, but they took a quite a long time to remove. Eventually, after long pauses, we were able to keep moving to up to the top of the gully. And it was only when we weren't fired at for about 30 minutes that we were able to realize that, in fact, the gully was finally clear and our task had been finished. When at last the artillery rounds landed on target just to our front, I said to the commander of my right forward platoon, Alistair Mitchell, to go ahead and, with his platoon, carry out a left-flanking attack to clear the enemy positions immediately to his front. And with supporting fire from uh, company headquarters, he did this. But... I was expecting, while he was doing it, a lot more supporting fire to come from the in-depth Argentinian positions. But as I lay there watching this attack go in, really the supporting fire that was coming was sporadic because the artillery had really neutralized the enemy in depth and got their heads down. And I realized that for about the next 30 seconds, until the Argentinians got their heads up, that really nobody controlled the battlefield and that that was our real chance to take the initiative. And although it's perhaps difficult in training ever to put your finger on a moment when the initiative passes in a battle, I would say that on tumbledown, you could actually touch that moment. Because I was then able to move forward with my company headquarters and shouting to the uh, platoon who were engaged in clearing those enemy positions, uh, I got them to come along with me to the first ridge 
And I thought if we could only reach that ridge, we would at least have cleared part of the Argentinian position, and then perhaps we can do exactly the same again to clear up to the next ridge, because in that place, Tumbledown is a series of false crests. In fact, we managed to clear away the three or four uh, Argentinian sangers and positions up to that first ridge, and when I got there, again, it seemed to me that we still held the initiative, that their heads were still down, and that if we continued doing exactly what we were doing, we could clear up to the next ridge. And really so it went on, clearing these sangers, clearing the positions, winkling them out with grenades and rifles. But because we were taking quite a few prisoners, uh, wounded Argentinians, and because we were also taking a number of casualties ourselves, uh, by the time we actually got to the top of the mountain, there were only seven of us. And I didn't even know that when we reached it, that was the top of the mountain. To me, it was just another false crest. But when we got to it and looked down the other side, we could see right into Stanley High Street, which was about two miles away. And I was so amazed by what I saw, because the lights were still on. You could see the plan of the streets. You could see car headlights moving up and down the street, that we stood absolutely stock still. And at that moment, an Argentinian uh, machine gun opened up about 100 metres to our front, and uh, four of those seven men were shot, including the platoon commander who was with me. When Le Flanc had succeeded in taking their objective, I really felt we were winning. However, I was concerned about the time because there was only about one and a half hours left before dawn, and I had to be secure, having taken the whole of Tumbledown, by dawn. Therefore, right flank moved up very quickly, and the company commander talked to the company commander of left flank and then attacked his final position, which was a lot of rocks, a lot of Argentinian snipers still left behind, and they had a very tough battle. However, by the time dawn broke, the company commander, Major Simon Price, reported to me that he had secured his position with one or two Argentinians still around in it. But nevertheless, the Argentinians were then, and one could see as light came up, fleeing towards Stanley, and Simon Price's forward observation officer engaged them with gunfire. My feelings at the end, after it was all over, were, I think, a mixture of triumph and disaster. Triumph, that we'd actually done it. But as the casualty figures started coming in, and I realised that in the space of one night, I had lost seven men killed and 21 wounded, I think that came to me as something of a shock in the cold grey light of dawn. The success of the Scots Guard in taking Mount Tumbledown in the face of determined opposition from the best troops General Menendez could put in the field, their position seemingly impregnable in the light of day, is an admirable example of fighting quality and junior leadership. While the battle for Tumbledown was being fought, to the north, two para were mounting their attack on Wireless Ridge. They were now commanded by Lieutenant Colonel David Chandler, who had been flown from the UK following the death of Colonel Jones. One thing which was quite clear that had come out of the battle for Darwin and Goose Green was the lack of fire support. And so, when I went round to talk to the battalion, one of the things that I said to them was that I guaranteed that if the battalion were committed again to battle, they would not have so little fire support. In phase one, we moved up in reserve behind three para and four five commando with no idea as to what our objective would be. And that, that afternoon after phase one, that's the afternoon of the 12th, I was told that we were to attack Wireless Ridge that night. And at that stage, we had not had any opportunity to patrol up onto Wireless Ridge or indeed get ourselves in a position to overlook it. And so we were working on very scanty intelligence. And I was somewhat relieved when later that evening the attack was postponed for 24 hours. And so the next day, I was able to go up onto Mount Longdon, overlook Wireless Ridge, as indeed were the company commanders. And it is largely from what we saw that I was able to make my subsequent plan. Well, the first thing I had to decide was whether to launch a silent or noisy attack. Now, up to that stage in the campaign, all the attacks, for very good reasons, had been silent attacks. But I decided on a noisy attack for three reasons. The first one was that I believed the element of surprise had now gone, so there was no advantage in going for a silent attack. The second reason was 
because command and control, particularly at the lower level, is a lot easier with a noisy attack. And the third reason was because I believed that the Argentinians were a second-class enemy and that they would not take kindly to a concentrated fire plan and were liable to crack. And this, I hoped, would mean that we would not have to do so much hand-to-hand -hand fighting with the casualties that would thus incur. For the Battle of Wireless Ridge, two power was allocated, two artillery batteries, eight and seven nine commando batteries. Eight batteries in position on Mount Kent have been there before the battle for Stanley started. Seven nine commando battery have been flown forward the previous day to a new gun position near Murrell Bridge. To give an illustration of the lift required, to lift the gun, guns, equipment and the personnel of the battery required about 15 seeking lifts and for just under 400 rounds per gun, another 35 lifts for the ammunition. The battalion was also allocated a Type 21 frigate that was going to become available about the time we are due to cross the start line. We had two, uh, two mortar platoons, two Paris mortar platoon of eight mortars, and following my recce earlier in the day up on Mount Longdon, three para had joined the two para mortar net and we had their mortars available as well, with three para mortar officer acting as anchor MFC. Also, three para's naval gunfire forward observer was acting as anchor FOO and would also control the naval gunfire when required. The battalion also had its own machine gun platoon of GPM GSF, and we had also additionally a troop of CVRT of the Blues and Royals, consisting of two Scorpion and two Scimitar. In phase one, uh, D Company attacked. They had a battery in direct support and were also supported by the CVRTs and by the machine guns platoon. Then A and B Company, in their phase two, started their attack. And I had a grandstand position for this. And what a remarkable sight it was, too. On the battlefield at night, you literally do have to turn night into day. And with the flares, the pyrotechnics, the tracer, with the artillery, and particularly these lines of tracer coming from the CVRTs, was a remarkable sight. And as I saw these two companies going in up that hill in front of me, down came an Argentinian DF onto a company who suffered a number of casualties. But both companies got onto their objective and again we were blessed with the sight of seeing the Argentinians running away and again opposition was reasonably slight. Judging by the number of maps and radio sets which some, in some cases were still switched on, this had been their headquarters. At this stage, C Company, which is the patrol company, regrouped with the assault engineer platoon, and they attacked the phase three objective, which they found completely abandoned. There were a number of pairs of boots on the objective, and uh, in fact, C Company claim that some of them were still warm, which bore witness to the very hasty Argentinian re retreat. Once they were secure, I then moved the CVRTs and the machine guns platoon up onto the phase two objective and we prepared for the final phase, phase four, which was that last ridge line on wireless ridge and was obviously going to be the toughest nut to crack. Well, D Company moved off the phase one objective round to the flank and they started their attack. This, I think, is one of my most memorable sights of my whole military career. We had the two batteries of guns, and the frigate, and the mortars, and of course, the four CVRTs and the machine guns. The weight of fire was quite devastating. Nevertheless, D Company did encounter a lot of stiff opposition on that ridge, and it took them rather longer to fight along it uh, than I had hoped. Where things for the platoon really got difficult was when we reached our limit of exploitation which had been picked from a map, and it was a telegraph line running right across the ridge. Uh, we got to it, uh, I informed the OC by radio, and the, the boys went to ground, partly in Argentine trenches, but mostly in uh, the naval trenches. They were the holes made by the 4.5-inch uh, guns that had been shelling the area. The company was then strung out right along the ridge, with myself the most easterly platoon. We then had a rather uncomfortable few hours waiting for light. We knew that if we could hang on until it got light, 
then from where we were, we overlooked Stanley and would have a very good shoot into it. In fact, really, we'd, we'd won the day if we could cling on. First light on the morning of the 14th of June, and the encirclement of Stanley was almost complete. The first 7th Gurkha rifles were able to take Mount William with little opposition, and the Welsh guards were poised to seize their objective, Sapper Hill. And all the time, the remorseless bombardment of the remaining Argentine positions was kept up. An Argentine cameraman filmed these scenes as troops poured back into Stanley. Officers and men argued openly in the streets, and with nowhere else to go, the will to fight on evaporated. Despite their many advantages, strategic, tactical and logistic, they had been outfought at every turn. Roger, a bit rough. Wireless Ridge, two para watched and waited. At first light, I moved up to D Company's position on the final ridge line. They had just repulsed a counterattack from Moody Brook. And standing on that ridge line, I saw this remarkable sight of the Argentinian army collapsing. And there were literally hundreds of soldiers, it's like black ants, pouring out of Moody Brook below me and off Tumbledown and Sapper Hill from across the valley. And Roger, out. There is a white flag flying over Stanley. <laughs> Very marvellous. <laughs> no more open fire. No more open fire. No more open fire. Safe weapon. You've not got one at the spot, though, have you? Well, the situation is that we are uh, in Stanley, and I understand that the general is going forward to talk to General Menendez in about half an hour. Now, what he's going to say to him, I don't know, and what the exact position is. I'm not uh, fully aware, but all I do know is that the shooting has stopped. Uh, we've overrun their main gun positions, uh, and they have taken themselves to the other end of town. I was picked up by uh, one of the naval helicopters from Fitzroy and flown right round to the east through a snowstorm in pretty unpleasant weather. And it seemed a mighty long journey, I must say. But we flew into the football pitch just beside Government House uh, and were met by our own people who were forward there and went into the administrative building to take the surrender. I was pretty nervous about this meeting, really. After all, I'd never taken a surrender before and it wasn't one of the subjects that had come up while I was at Staff College. I don't suppose anybody else had either. I'd thought about the document, obviously, and I had three copies of a document with me. And I was in a rather bare, sparse room with a table and a number of chairs, and there were about six of us. And Menendez came in with his three supporters, who were senior staff officers, and we sat round the table. I presented the document to him, and I told him that we'd greatly admired the way many of the Argentinians had behaved, uh, and in particular, such as their Air Force had been very brave, and presented the document, which he looked at, and said that he didn't like the word unconditional before surrendered. I understood that he felt that this was belittling to him and his troops, and therefore, since it didn't seem to me to make a great deal of difference to the facts of the case, was quite happy to cross it out. We did that, and then after a bit of discussion about where people would go and making arrangements that he would move his men back from the frontal area and we would move them out of Stanley the following day and my troops would not enter Stanley that night. Uh, we had a cup of tea uh, and departed on our various ways. The surrender was unconditional in everything but name. 
with the signing of the surrender document, the battle for the Falklands was over. Thank you.